but thank you all so much for joining us here tonight. It is autism month and as Temple said, the world needs different kinds of minds and you all just by showing up here tonight are you doing your part in helping create a more inclusive world for different kinds of minds. So thank you to all of you for making this time and sharing your evening with us. My name is Marissa. I'm one of the co-founders of Beaming Health. Beaming Health, we are a uh, company that's trying to create a better world for neurodiverse families. And there are three key parts of our site I just wanted to share with all of you so you can use it for your own families or share it with any families you know that are touched by autism. The first big thing we help families with is finding the best care options for their family covered by their insurance, whether you're looking for speech therapy, OT, you name it, you can find it here. The second big thing is a community feature where families can connect with other families, share their experiences, and ask experts questions around health, insur health insurance, everyone's favorite, and special education and more. And lastly, a learning center here. We have a, a number of amazing clinicians, some of whom are on with us tonight, who've helped us build out incredible content for families that they know they can trust. And tonight, if you are excited to share more about us, learn more about us, we would love it if you can follow us on social media, beaming.health on Instagram. We will be doing a giveaway. So three lucky folks will get to get a gift card following the event. So, uh, feel free to do that here. But without further ado, I am so excited tonight to be introducing the iconic world-renowned autism champion, scientist, inventor, author, professor, animal rights advocate, Dr. Temple Grandin. She has served as such an inspiration and role model to literally hundreds of thousands of people on the spectrum. And a few interesting facts that I love and some fun photos to go along with it. All right. Oh. Sorry, just okay, wait a minute. You had you had me muted. Oh, there you are. Hey, Temple. Okay, yeah. Perfect. You had me muted. Yes, I'm okay, sorry. Okay, now uh, what were all um, um I what were all the things you wanted me to talk about tonight? Oh yes, don't you worry. We'll get right there in just a moment. Uh, okay. Really quick. Right. Yep, really quickly before we get into that, just a few fun facts about Temple. So she didn't speak until she was three and a half years old, and. She received incredible speech therapy and had amazing teachers who helped her develop along the way. And half the cattle in the US, by the way, that's 47 million cattle in the United States are handled in facilities she designed. That's a lot of cattle. Thank you so much, Temple. She also loves okay. country western music, which is why we kicked off with the song we did. And my personal favorite thing, Temple, that I found out while preparing for tonight was that you love Phantom of the Opera and that you love to play. Oh, yes, yes, I was. Um... I was just visiting a college that had a great big antique organ in it, and I said, I'd like to sit there and blow me away with that big organ playing Phantom of the Opera. Oh, that yeah. Would be, that would be just so cool. Oh, yeah, big time. All right. Uh, and so just there, there's an expression that you don't grow out of autism, you grow into it. And Temple, I just think you're a perfect example of this, of how you've really just grown into your autism, your strengths, and but served as such an inspiration to so many people. And so if how we're going to run through tonight, I'm going to start off with uh, 15 minutes or so of prepared questions. We have some questions a bunch of folks sent in via email. Thank you so much for that. We'll do some of those questions and then we'll do some live Q&A to okay, close that it out. Sounds good. Sounds great. All right. First, Temple, as you know, it's autism month. Words matter. How we talk about autism matters. One concept I've heard you talk about is that it's kind of a barrier to the autism community at times is this idea of label locked thinking, just this idea of what people think or have in their minds when they hear autism. Would love your advice or to hear you share more about how you describe autism to people who've maybe never encountered someone on the spectrum before. How do you share what autism is with folks who- Well, if you've worked in anything involving engineering, you've encountered somebody with autism. <laughs> It's, um, it's that simple. You see, you're going from Elon Musk and Einstein at, to somebody who can't dress themselves. You know, and they've changed the criteria to where now you have this huge uh, spectrum going from uh, no speech delay, socially awkward, to um, very severe, maybe epilepsy, uh, can't talk, and maybe even have movement disorders. And all of this is given the same name. And I think this has made the label locking worse. Because back in the, in the 70s, to be labeled with autism, the child had to have obvious speech delay prior to age three, obvious speech delay. Then in 
early 90s, they added the Asperger's, which is basically socially awkward with no speech delay. And then in the 2013, they merged it all together. And I'm, so now you've got such a huge variation. And I've been doing a lot of um, research into how people think. In fact, I've got a new book coming out on visual thinking. Um, you know, the hidden uh, genius of people who think in pictures, patterns, and abstractions. And you can actually pre-order on Amazon right now. I've been Temple Grandin, visual thinking. And what I'm finding is you have visual thinkers like me that are super good at things like art and mechanical stuff. Then you've got your mathematical thinkers, and then you have your verbal thinkers. And the verbal thinkers tend to be the worst on getting locked into the labels because they think in words. Where I think in pictures, and I'm seeing Elon Musk, it's got the same name as um, somebody that has epilepsy and has a, cannot talk. The, the, those, those are very, very different. And we need to be looking at what the, the individual can do. And one of the big problems I'm seeing, especially on the fully verbal end of the spectrum, is um, parents getting so label locked that, that teenagers are not learning basic skills like shopping, learning how to save money, having a bank account just basic stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Totally. No, really appreciate that. Um, and uh, you already sort of alluded to this a bit in your answer, but just how has your perspective on autism changed over the years? Just the label of it and the power of thinking differently. Has there, yeah, how has that changed for well, you? Well, when I was like, in my twenties, I didn't think, I didn't know that other people thought in words. I did not know that in my twenties. But that helped me in my cattle handler work because I looked at what cattle were looking at. And I was kind of shocked when I found out that some people think in words. And, and what I'm concerned about is I'm seeing too many smart kids um, going nowhere, getting addicted to video games and things like that. And if they were getting fabulous jobs in the video game industry, you know, programming, maybe even sales or, or, um, or, um, uh, animation I wouldn't be criticizing but that's not what's happening and when I was out working all the time on these big heavy construction jobs and and big cargill plants are being built I worked with skilled drafting design professionals and um, skilled tradespeople that were inventing things and 20 percent of those were either autistic dyslexic or ADHD on the all undiagnosed and what saved them was the hands-on classes in the schools worst thing the schools ever did taking out shop, but also taking out music, art, theater, cooking, sewing, woodworking, all of these kinds of things. We've got a huge skill shortage right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought this up and we're definitely gonna dig more into that uh, here in just a second. I Zooming out a little bit, Temple, just because I know we do have a lot of really incredible family members, caregivers here on the line. Can you talk a little bit about some of the most impactful adults in your life growing up and maybe what it was that they did for you that was so meaningful? All right, let's just start with my mother. And I was very lucky to have been taken to a neurologist, not a psychiatrist, a neurologist, Bronson Crothers, Boston Children's Hospital. There's an endowed chair at that hospital for Bronson Crothers. And he tested me for epilepsy and deafness. And then he referred me to a little speech therapy school that two teachers taught out of their home. And I got very good early intervention. I can't emphasize how important that was. And my mother had a very good sense of just how much to stretch me, not just suddenly force me into something I couldn't handle, but stretch. And she always um, encouraged my ability in drawing. Now I would tend to just draw the same horse head. She said, let's draw the saddle, let's draw the stable. Broaden it, broaden it. I had a fabulous third grade teacher and my mother and the third grade teacher in my, in my elementary school worked together to make consistent rules. Another super influential person was Mr. Carlock, my science teacher. He was really, really important. And I was not studying in school. I didn't see any reason to study. I was just kind of a goof off. And, and what got me interested in studying is Mr. Carlock gave me interesting projects and showed me how on... Um, uh, science, studying was a pathway to a goal. And then there was Jim the contractor. And I'd been out in the field and he'd seen my drawings and he'd seen some of my work and he seeked me out. So this brings up another really important thing. And that important thing is to show your work. See, the way I used to sell jobs and when I was in high school, was sign painting, is I simply showed pictures of my signs and here's some of my drawings that are in my book, Thinking in Pictures. 
I learned to sell my work and I made a portfolio of work. You know, and they'd look at my work, my drawings, pictures of jobs. And when I was painting signs, that taught really important work skills. And I'd show my sign portfolio uh, to an old, I showed it to an old sign painter at the Arizona State Fair and I painted signs for carnival attractions and facility carnival attractions. But I was learning really important work skills doing that. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, this is a perfect segue too because I've heard you talk about this and it's so incredible. And I'm curious what advice you would give to folks that have folks on the spectrum in their life, especially parents, caregivers. How do they, how, when should they maybe start exposing their kids to these different interests or any advice you would have? Well, look, everything. I got involved in the cattle industry because I got exposed to it as a teenager. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of kids today aren't getting exposed to enough stuff in order, why would I draw a picture of a horse head if I hadn't seen a horse? Mm -hmm. and, and kids are not getting out and getting exposed to enough stuff. I was just at an autism school just the other day and I heard about a teenager that uh, they were teaching them small engine repair and they took a small engine like for a lawnmower apart. And while the teacher was gone, he put it all back together again. And he's in 18, he needs to be working in a shop. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. And instead of rewarding him with video games, let's buy him a tool chest, an empty tool chest. And you're going to earn tools. Because what's been found on with some of these video game addicts, there's been three cases where the video games were successfully replaced with car mechanics. And I'm talking serious car mechanics, taking engines apart, not just lube jobs. And they both, all three of the adults found that um, motors were a lot more interesting than video games were but you have to do it slowly, have to do it slowly. No, this, this kid needs to be rewarded with a, a slowly, you build up your, your tool chest and you're gonna become a mechanic. And I think a lot of some of his behavior problems are gonna stop because he knows if he throws a wrench, uh, that absolutely will not be tolerated. Right. You know, right. You've got, you're gonna to have to behave like a grown up in the shop. It's just that simple. Mm -hmm. And simple, I know, um... One thing I'd love to hear more about, I love what you talked about, about showing your work and creating a portfolio and using that to sh sell jobs. What kind of other maybe workplace or professional tips would you have to kids on the spectrum or young adults or others in the workplace? Well, we need to be starting training the work skills early. Let's start off with simple things. And kids are like seven. This was done in our neighborhood. They had to dress up in their good clothes and be little party hostesses and hosts, meet the guests, learn how to shake hands. I was just down to autism school. The kids were terrible on not knowing how to shake hands. Let not to just look at someone and say, you know, good evening, you know, Dr. Grandin, you know, just basic stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then when they're around 11, we've got to find a replacement for the paper route. Because a lot of the grandfathers I talked to that discover they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed all had paper routes. So how about a church volunteer job? Helping out at the farmer's market, putting up the tent and helping helping a farmer sell their stuff at the farmer's market. Instant illegal, they need to get real jobs. Instant illegal. And because working skills are very different than, um, uh, than school skills. And now the thing you're asking, how do you find your interests? You gotta get out and get exposed to stuff. I can tell you one class I hated in school was cooking class, I hated that. And I loved sewing. But how are you gonna know if you're not exposed? I tried musical instruments. I never could figure out how to play a flute, a little recorder flute. I tried it, but you see that's exposure. You know, you don't know until you expose the kid. How, and because I got fixated on carnival rides in high school because I got, I went on one, you know, that's exposure. Mm -hmm. And here's some mother saying her daughter is amazing a video, uh, making video productions. Um, you know, what I would do on that is put together a good demo reel and let's just uh, not go to car dealership and offer to make a car ad and show off that demo reel. But the thing is, you've got to show that car dealership a, a demo reel they want to see. They don't want to see space aliens or, you know, Hoka Man or, or, you know, some Fortnite thing. They don't want to see that. Make a demo reel that a bank or a, you know, local TV station could run as an ad. You just, and that. the other thing, you've got to have your, your portfolio on you. That demo reel needs to be on your phone and it needs to be on mom and dad's phone because you never know where you can whip it out and show it to somebody. 
because that's how I sold jobs. I showed people my portfolio. Yeah, and okay, some people don't say your son, say your son doesn't have autistic, so, so high functioning. Well, there's still social awkwardness. I can tell you stuff I still am, have a disability on. I cannot remember long strings of verbal instructions. Hmm. I have to make myself a pilot's checklist. Let's say closing out the cash drawer. I need to make a little pilot's checklist. I also can't multitask. Don't put me on the crazy multitasking job. That I simply cannot do. Um, and also vague instructions don't work. Um, also, a lot of people have these social chit chat conversations that go back and forth really fast and they're having such a good time and I can't even follow those. My processor speed's too slow, but that doesn't affect doing design work. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is to, is to show the strength. I recently watched the Paralympics and I watched it live. I'm really glad that I did. Mm -hmm. And the sit down slalom skiing, amazing. These are people that are paraplegics and they're doing the most amazing slalom skiing or a special single ski. That's the kind of stuff I like seeing mm -hmm. because Stephen Hawking, the famous scientist, he couldn't even hardly move. He said, concentrate on the things <clears throat> your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. He could do math in his head super well and not much else. Mm -hmm. I, I love this temple and it's a really nice segue. I'm seeing some great activity in the chat about this too, about just how do you, how do you convey this or how, how can we help both just the people we know in our lives and our kids just focus on these strengths and also curious how you thought about when to disclose that you're on the spectrum? Or well, when I was out working, I never disclosed. The only thing I ever disclosed was, let me write down some of the design specifications for this job. Mm -hmm. I would disclose something now. I just say, pilots need a checklist. I need a checklist for, for finishing out the cash drawer. Mm -hmm. And I would leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Or um, they, um, or I'm terrible at multitasking, mm -hmm. or I need a quiet place to work. You know, there's a type, place to disclose and a place not to disclose. And there's been a lot of issue, you know, discussion about masking and about the anxiety and burnout. Now, I think some of this autistic burnout I've been hearing about, like in the late 20s, is anxiety. And I can relate to that. I had horrible anxiety, and I talk about it in my book, Thinking in Pictures. And I've been on antidepressant medication for 40 years. It saved me, absolutely saved me. It's an old fashioned drug. I have Google Earth the factory. I commune with the factory. I hope nobody hurts that factory because that drug saved me. Now it's an old fashioned drug. You can use Prozac, but make sure the dose is kept low. I've had a hundred people tell me, did wonderful on low dose, raised the dose in agitation and insomnia. Don't do that. Um, but, and I've worked with visual thinkers professionally that had taken Prozac, helped them a whole lot. One of them was a, a Vietnam veteran. Mm -hmm. I'm brilliant at drawing, just brilliant. Um, but I, what gives me, I think I've really thought about what, what's important to me in life. And it's having an interesting career. And I read something that made me very, very upset. My science magazine top science journal. And I read about a scientist over in the Ukraine. He uh, studied prehistoric whale fossils. And um, he wanted to save his life's work. Couldn't take the whale fossils out, they were too big. He had this little hard drive thing. You know, it's about the size of this book. And his life's work on it. Trying to download it on a really slow internet connection to France to save it. Mm -hmm. I was just crying. I, don't, I can't look at the portable hard drive now without getting upset because I'm thinking about that scientist hard work on a hard drive. And if that hard drive is destroyed, you see that's what, you know, when you really get into what is identity for me and I can't even talk about this stuff crying. I mean, if I go on the Best Buy and I look at a hard drive, portable hard drive, I'm gonna get upset because you know, look at that thing. Well, that had his life, his entire life work, life's work was on that. And he, had it in a bag on the train is going to try to get to a better internet connection. You know, you drop it in a puddle and it's gone. You know, he want he wanted to get it downloaded somewhere else safe. 
save his life's work because that's his identity. And a lot of the people I've worked with, um, you know, their identity is, well, I invent things, I built things. So. Totally. And, and um, that's why I put so much emphasis on career because career is what's given me meaning in life. Now I'll be 75 this August and I will not ever have to take my shoes off in the airport ever again. <laughs> when you're 75, that's a little perk you get. I love that. I won't have to take my shoes off at the airport. I can't wait. That's, yeah. that's well, great. I'll celebrate my birthday. Um, usually I, I'm on TSA pre and I don't have to take them off, but sometimes when I'm, you got to go on some other airline, I got to take them off. I had to take them off the other day. Oh no. But I've thought about that. One little tiny perk. That is a great um, temple. Well, I kind of think in, in the stage of my life that I'm at now, I've had parents say to me, my son went to college because of you. I kind of pushed my son, he got a job and he just blossomed. I've heard this term blossoming, blooming. When they get out and do more things. Okay, somebody's got a 12 year old daughter who's a beautiful pianist. Mm -hmm. Well, let's um, you can make a career out of that. Um, you know, playing, a you know, playing in a hotel lobby. You know, I started off painting signs. But that taught me very important skills. Signs at a carnival. Yeah, that, that, but I learned important skills from that. Love it. Still and there? Yes, still here, Temple. Your camera went off. So. Yes, yes. Just uh, one last question here, and then we're going to segue to community questions. But uh, when I, something that I've seen from you and others on the spectrum that helped me with this help me convey the strengths of autism is just thinking about people like you and other incredible creators and inventors on the spectrum. Could you share if there are who your favorite folks on the spectrum are your favorite autistic inventors or creators that inspire oh, you? Tesla, Tesla who invented the electrical power plant, AC electricity. And of course there's a car now named after him, Elon Musk. I always thought Elon Musk was autistic when I read Ashley Vance's book, but I couldn't say it. But um, I, now he's come out, so I can now say it. But he's somebody who's all careers. He sold all his mansions, and he lives in a boxable at his spaceport. And when you watch him give a tour of his factories, I've looked at a bunch of those videos, he loves his factories. He loves the stuff he does. He loves his cars and his rockets. And, totally. You know, that to him is the stuff that matters. And I can really relate to that. Okay, I have somebody here. See, the, the other problem with guys, we got such a spectrum. Okay, here's a 10 year old twirling around sticks and things like that. I assume maybe he's non verbal. Uh, one of the things you might do in a situation like that is let's turn twirling sticks into a game where we share a stick and we take turns twirling it. This was a very important thing I learned as a kid. We had a lot of turn taking games. So I learned how to wait and take turns. That was done a lot with me when I was four and five years old. That's, uh, I, and then, uh, well, some of this twirling stuff, it's kind of sensory and sensory problems are real. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, in Temple, we did have, we had a lot of folks who sent in some questions before. If it's okay with you, I can run. Well, I'm reading a whole bunch of chat stuff right here. Yeah. Some of the three-year-olds having a meltdown. Um, sometimes you need to have limits. Um, well, Sometimes kids just have tantrums. Um, they, um, you know, when a kid gets older, some of the things that cause meltdowns are sensory overload, like if it happens in the middle of a busy Walmart, that's probably sensory overload. Um, frustration because they can't communicate, they're nonverbal. Got to give them a way to communicate. Got to, got to give them a way to communicate. Sign language, a picture board. You know, fancy communication device, a text messaging on a tablet, but something to communicate with. And then sometimes a nonverbal individual, now a three year old, hopefully, is learning how to talk. But an older nonverbal individual can't tell you if he has a hidden painful medical problem, like a tummy ache, an earache, a tooth infection, a urinary tract infection. Sometimes there's a lot of bad behavior that's caused by a hidden medical problem, simple medical problem that just needs to be treated. And there's a tendency sometimes for doctors to bless just autism, when really what the problem is is acid reflux. And I've had that, and it hurts a lot. Yeah, and then you take a Rolaids for it. 
or some yeah. other over-the-counter drug fraud. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I know that's so important, just understanding what's really going on behind the behavior. Yeah, here's somebody said, how do you get parents to understand they need to introduce these skills? Well, I come out of the construction industry, so I'm kind of blunt about it. And I, I said, no, you've got to. You slowly do it. Mother had a very good sense of stretching. So you don't suddenly force them, like force them into the deep end of the pool. You don't do that. But you stretch them because if they don't learn these skills, they're not going to progress. This is what bothers me. Um, and we've got a gigantic skill shortage right now in high end skilled trades. If you want to build a poultry processing plant right now, how about 100 shipping containers full of equipment from Holland? Yeah, that's a problem. Definitely. Uh, Temple, uh, a few questions that came in from the community are from Cindy. My daughter, Melanie, is 11. She's very bright, loves making videos on her iPad, loves music and putting it all together, trying to figure out how to best support it. Doesn't seem like there are lots of things out there tailored to kids on the spectrum. Any all right, well, let's just look at what, how we can, I, I would want to look at her videos. Like just today, I was over at a friend's house having lunch and heard about a a, a, a 12 year old kid's very good at drawing. Uh, one of the people wanted to write a children's book. I said, let me see your drawings. And if they're good enough, we're gonna go to a book agent and I'm never gonna, I'm not gonna tell a book agent she's 12 years old. Well, we'll have to when we sign a contract because we can't sign a contract, but let's sell the job first. And she didn't have the stuff on the phone. You see, this is where you, you gotta have the portfolio there. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna carry a 12 years old, the art's good enough. Right. If you're good enough, you're old it's enough. Like, it's like if you take, if you're a fancy photographer with a whole room full of equipment and you took your best picture on a phone, you don't have to tell anybody that you used a phone. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Uh, here it's from, that simple. Exactly. Here from Karen Temple. My autistic teenager wants to live on a ranch and be a scientist when she grows up. Sound familiar? What practical advice can you offer for how to get from the stress and social isolation that she's feeling in high school right now to this life of her dreams? Well, high school is the worst part of my life. And the only place I had friends was friends who shared interests. And we had a model rocket club and an electronics club. And then my other big thing was everything horses. Now, I know there's a lot, they, uh, and we're riding horses, running, run, I ran our school's horse barn, uh, electronics club and model rocket club. Those were places where there were no bullies. Get involved with things with friends who shared interests. It could be a robotics club. You get really good at what you did. I can tell you, going to the cattle industry in the 70s, being a woman was a much bigger barrier than autism. Autism was like a non-issue. Being a woman was a gigantic issue. And they really did put bull testicles on my vehicle that was shown in the movie. That actually happened. Wow. Um, um, Temple, you talked a little bit about no bullies in the shared interests or no bullies in those clubs for special interests, shared interests that you had. Is that sort of the best advice you would give for parents? I hear from parents. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I want to try to get shared interests. Yeah, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, 4-H, FFA. 4-H is a great organization. Even in the cities, they have it. Do the county agent. Mm -hmm. Do the local university. Definitely. You know, church camps. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, get outside of the medical model and the educational model. That's what you need to be doing. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. On uh, a little bit of a different note, just going back to something you were discussing a little bit ago, sensory issues. Do you have oh, any? They're, they're, sensory issues are a big issue. Now, one of the things that can help a kid tolerate a sound is if the kid can control it. Well, I've had talked to a parent where the kid went from hating the vacuum cleaner to loving it when he got to play with it. He could turn it on and off. Same thing with hair dryers or car horns. Let the kid control it. On uh, another thing is with the headphones, if you wear headphones all the time, it's going to make the sensitivity worse. But what you want to do is let the child have control, have them with you all the time, have them with you, but then try not to wear them all the time. But they're there with you for those really horrible noise places. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. I know it's super relevant for my, my own family. And uh, driving, let me tell you. 
you start out really slow. I learned on a really bulky three on the tree in an ancient pickup truck. In fact, I got this cute little squeezy toy that was the, I got this about two years ago. That's the truck I learned to drive on right there. That's what it was. And really terrible clutch, three on the tree, lurching around the horse pasture. That's where you start. Middle of big parking lots. It's going to take a lot more practice. And I do a lot of practice before you let driver's edge shove them into it too quickly. A lot more practice because you've got to get the operation of the car into, into motor memory before you touch traffic. That will solve the multitasking issue. A lot more practice. And my aunt's mailbox was three miles away on the ranch. And we went up and back there every day, six days a week. That was 36 miles a week. I did 200 of those miles before we did traffic. Go into it a lot more slowly, but you steadily and slowly need to go into it. And you start off in very, very safe places where it's nothing to hit. Horse pasture, giant parking lot, places like that. Love it. Um, another question here from Daisy around just curious to get your thoughts on ABA therapy. You know, it has critics and people who love it. Just would love to hear your perspective on the therapy. On what now? ABA therapy, behavioral well, therapy. Well, there's all kinds of ABA. And there was some old fashioned, rigid, bad ABA where uh, kids were forced into sensory overload. That's not acceptable. Now, there's a lot of different things labeled ABA. And the thing I found, let's talk about little kids programs first. What you gotta have is enough hours with an effective teacher for like two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. What's an effective teacher? More language, better at turn-taking, more skills like dressing and washing their hands. And number four, the child should love his therapist. If the child hates the therapist, they're probably driving them into sensory overload. A good teacher has the knack and I have found that teachers do the same thing regardless of what the name of the program is. Now, I don't like some of this rigid stuff, especially with fully verbal kids when they get older. It just gets too rigid and weird. And also, even with a nonverbal, you make them do something stupid, like set and unset the table 10 times in a row, and then they get mad. Nobody does that in real life. You set the table, you eat, and then you clean it up. And, you know, have them do real things. Awesome. Super, super helpful, Temple. Uh, another question here from Janet. Dr. Grannon, you're truly an inspiration. My 10-year-old nephew is on the spectrum. He has the most generous and genuine spirit. One of his innate abilities appears to be music and rhythm. Although sensory challenges do exist, what are your thoughts about which instruments, if any, are most conducive to kids on the spectrum? His pitch is near perfect. I would just try different things. Get a chance to try some different things. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, you know, that's where you just can maybe try some, you know, um, watch some videos, maybe of different instruments, and watch different people play them. And, and I um, no, I would just uh, leave it wide open on which one to try. Awesome. Uh, let's see a uh, couple more here and then we'll, we'll switch over to live questions. Uh, advice for, for parents when their kids are having these meltdowns or tantrums, just if there is anything else you would add to what you mentioned earlier. Well, you got to figure out what causes the tantrum or the meltdown. Is it biology or behavior? Okay, biology would be, let's say, in a nonverbal kid, a stomach ache is not being treated. Uh, sensory overload would be another one. And then the frustration because he can't communicate. And then there's some kids that learn to pitch a fit to get out of something. They manipulate by pitching fits. And you've got to be a really good detective. But I've got to rule out frustration because they can't communicate, sensory overload, and a painful medical problem that they can't tell you about first. And a lot of the painful medical problems are simple stuff to create. It's just regular stuff that a normal kid would tell you about. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Super helpful. Last one here that we're hearing a lot about is just how we can support kids on the spectrum socially, uh, seeing a lot of interest from, I'm assuming parents, but just when their kids are having trouble making friends, how parents can play a well, better. This is where let's start, you know, getting them into clubs. One enterprising teacher started a Star Wars club for an autistic kid. And that then the other kids got involved in the Star Wars club. Mm -hmm. um, you know, here's some where the kids are bullying a child. First of all, teachers need to explain. I managed to get through elementary school without being bullied. And the reason for that is my teacher, Mrs. Deitch, 
third grade teacher explained to the other children that I had a disability that wasn't visible, like a wheelchair, and they needed to be helping me. That has a name. It's called peer mediated intervention. And I've got a paper online called How Horses Help the Teenager with Autism Make Friends and Learn How to Work. She did peer mediated intervention. And that school needs to be doing that. Awesome. Love it. We'll turn it over here for some live Q&A. Thank you so much, everyone, for your patience. We'll start off here with Summer Costner. Who There's another thing about the making videos. The other thing, 11-year-old daughter is old enough to start learning to make videos on assignment. My very first sign painting job was for a hair salon. Well, I had to make a, a sign that they would want. So I put the Breck lady on it. That was a mascot for a shampoo company in the 60s. I, you, you know, and that's not my, I'd rather put a flying saucer on it, but I don't think that hair salon would have liked that very much. You see, and when you're making something on an assignment, you got to make something they would want. And I'd like to start encouraging her, well, maybe she'd make a video for a church picnic or something, but something where you're making a video on some kind of an assignment, you see, and then you're learning a work skill there. Make a really good church picnic video. video. Maybe you can make a car ad for a local TV station. You live out in a rural, a rural area. That's actually something you could do quite easily. They have little bitty TV stations. I can tell you some of the advertising is definitely amateur. Love it. Summer, are you ready here to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Temple, Ms. Grandin, for being here. Um, I would love to hear what you consider to be some of the inherent gifts of autism and what can the neurotypical community learn from people who have autism? Well, the, the visual thinkers like me, the object visualizers, and I do have some information on that in my book, The Autistic Brain. I present some of the science behind object visualizer like me who thinks in pictures. HBO movies show very nicely how I think in pictures and the things I'm good at, art, mechanical stuff, animals and photography. Then the mathematical kids, good at computer programming, mathematics, they need to be moved ahead in math, chemistry, physics, now, the kind of stuff I can't do is algebra. I'm very concerned that my kind of mind, who'd be very good at skilled trades, is getting screened out because of algebra requirements. And I've talked to older people that have businesses, big shops. Well, they were allowed to take business math for running their business instead of algebra. Um, and then you have your word thinkers. This is the autistic kid that knows all the historical facts about something he's interested in, or all kinds of stuff about sports teams. And they're definitely not interested in, in mathematics or, or mechanics or any of that kind of stuff. They'd be really good at specialized retail, like working in the phone store or working where they could sell some special cars. There's been some big successes with people on the spectrum selling cars, very big successes. I know four or five of them I've talked to because they'll know every feature of every car out on the lot. And people appreciate that. And they also don't try to sell the whole lot. They, the good salesman picks out the right car for the person or the right phone or the right printer, whatever the thing is, they're selling specialized retail is what that would be. Awesome. Thanks, Temple. Next here, Danielle, are you ready to ask your question? Yeah, I'm ready. Go away. <laughs> You caught me off guard. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, like I had said in uh, the chat, my son is very high functioning. And I definitely get a, a sense that um, that whole, oh, it's a phase of he'll grow out of it. Um, and they don't understand the struggles that we go through. Um, and also he is in a, a mainstream uh, kindergarten class. And how's the kindergarten class going? It's actually going wonderful. He's good. doing amazing. Good. He's, uh, he's getting good grades Good. and doing great, but he does come home a lot saying, you know, 
nobody wants to play with me. Nobody likes me. And I wonder what is the best. Uh, kids are very receptive. So I wonder what is the best way to encourage him in well, those think, situations. One thing you got to learn at that age is how to take turns at games. Mm -hmm. That is something you have to learn how to do. And there was a lot of work done with me on that. Playing board games, learning how to take turns. You know, sharing toys, taking turns. Uh, I think that my speech teacher put a lot of emphasis on that, a lot of emphasis. We are definitely doing that in ABA therapy. He is, he's struggling, but he is. Well, but learning. that's something they've got to learn mm -hmm. is taking turns. Um, and what's the age now? He's five, he'll be six in a couple months. And, and, um, you know, when I was a little kid, I was, you know, I like to do a lot of the things little kids did, swinging and uh, go, you know, we had a scuzzy old pond at our school and we'd go get polywogs out of it and stuff like that. <laughs> we liked doing that. He's very, um, like, he loves dinosaurs. That's like his thing. Well, but that, lots of kids love dinosaurs. Okay, now that's something that can be a shared interest. Mm -hmm. little kid little kids like dinosaurs but it's to the point where he only wants to play dinosaur games <laughs> well but you see this gets back to learning how to take turns mm -hmm. okay well, we got to play some dinosaur games but the other kid might want to play some other kind of a game see this yes. is where you have to learn how to take turns and this is something that has to be taught mm -hmm. the other thing i had to learn when i was in high school i got fixated on this rotor carnival ride and that's all i wanted to do was talk about that and that just drove everybody crazy. You know, I could tell, talk about that carnival ride maybe twice and then that's it. Well, I definitely and want to. Other, I mean, I have things now where I have a friend that sells my books for me and we're aviation geeks and our idea of fun time at dinner is to look up YouTube videos of airliners taking off like fighter jets. <laughs> that's <laughs> no, that's kind of stuff, even an Airbus. <laughs> well I definitely want to tell you uh when I found out about you as a teenager I said I could have an autistic child that'd be I could handle that and lo and behold my son is autistic oh he's only and five and the thing that you want to look at is he improving he is if you're improving then you're doing something right now sometimes improvement may be slow but if you're on, if you're improving, and then the other thing we need to be teaching table manners. And another thing that was done in the 50s is what I call teachable moments. So if I stuck my finger in the mashed potatoes, my mother would say, use the fork. Give the instruction right? instead of screaming no. Yes. And you might have a three or four teachable moments at every meal. And you need to have some sit-down meals where everybody puts their phones away. Absolutely. Oh, another room. Love it. And, and I think that, because that also, I think, is an important part of therapy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being a pioneer in this field. And I'm not suggesting anything that's, you know, really difficult or expensive. These were, th you see, why is that granddad who probably had, you know, no big speech delay, or maybe a little speech delay that's an engineer, a pharmacist, or an accountant got a job. Well, you see, in my generation, just manners and social skills were taught to all children in a much more structured way. Absolutely. And I think it really makes a difference. I just was on, um, on a, I did a talk to Pakistan last week and one to Abertizan. I don't know how to say it correctly, but I explained to them that you have to teach them like in a foreign country. For example, in my country, I don't know that it, in your country, I know it's rude to show the bottom of your foot. Now that's something that I have no way of knowing that. Now just imagine everything you teach the autistic child is like teaching somebody how to behave in a foreign country. Somebody has to tell me that in a Middle Eastern country, it's rude to show the bottom of your foot. I'd have no way of knowing that unless somebody told me. You see, though, every but you see, with an autistic kid, everything has to be taught, and and I uh, because it doesn't come instinctually, you know. And I find a lot of chit chat conversations. Um, after a while, I get um, uh, 
well, I, I can't follow them for one thing, they go too fast. My attention, my attention shifting is too slow. But then on the other hand, I had a great airplane ride about two weeks ago. I sat next to a construction manager lady and you know what we talked about for our plane? Concrete forming systems, uh, tilt up warehouse construction mm -hmm. and some of the changes that are gonna have to be made in tilt up warehouse construction. Concrete forms, concrete mixing, super, super good flight. Okay, you see, <laughs> most people wouldn't want to spend two hours talking about tilt up construction of warehouses. I find that really interesting. I love that. That's a perfect pairing on a plane, if you ask me. Oh, no, that was, that was a really, really, really good flight. Oh, I bet. I had a fun time on that flight and I got her card and I gave her my, she took my phone number. Oh, there you go. But that, but you see, that's an example of a shared interest. Mm -hmm. Temple, we had, uh, we have a really fun guest join us. His name is Mario. He had a short video we wanted to share quickly that includes something incredible that you actually uh, created. I'm going to share it here quickly. Okay. Hey, when parents suggest things, it doesn't always work. So sometimes you need a little help, even if it's from a uh, furry monster. Cookie Monster helps Dante use his squeeze yeah. machine. How do you use that? Oh. Hold the handle. I'm coming. Okay, you ready? Ready. Okay, put your head here. Okay, just ready? Oh, big squeeze. Count one, two. <laughs> You're goofy. It's the belly. I know our temple that was, of course, your squeeze machine. And Mario here from the video is here to ask a question. Yeah, no, I yeah. well, I'm glad. Thank you for showing that. And and okay, this was a kid wanting to do iPad rather than play. Um, you know, just hold his airplane. Well, I was out flying my airplane. I'm, I, I'm experimenting with it. Mm -hmm. You know, just doing all kinds of things outside. And and I, this is my book of kids projects. These are, these are all projects I did as a kid. I, I found when I did a book signing for this four years ago, the 20% to 30% of elementary school children in a suburb of Denver had never made a paper airplane. That's ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. Mario here, do you have your question? Absolutely. Uh, so Temple, as a 47-year-old father, Temple Grandin has been a name uh, in our family for many, many, many years. And uh, just like you think in pictures, my son Dante thinks in movies. And oh, okay. uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a very uh, that's a terrible regression. And we took to social media and we started doing videos on what we're doing in our home and okay. how Temple thought in pictures and Dante thinks in movies. And it took me learning every, almost every word to Shrek so I can communicate with Dante if he's having a meltdown. I was able to communicate. He was telling me he was scared. And one of the things that I struggle with nowadays is that I'm doing a video on social media. I'm trying to help parents um, get over that bridge of trying to understand their child is they don't want to show, they don't want to do videos with their kids because they don't think, um, they, they don't think it's important that their children watch videos or they want to do it their way. And I struggle so hard because I want to just like, I mean, who wants to do it their way? The kid wants the, to do the it their parent, way? The, the parents want the child to do it their way. And the child obviously is struggling because they want to learn in their own way. And my question well, to you what's is- What's an example of the parent doing a video their well, way? The, you, you an example, more specific one, on of the, one of the families don't believe that electronics is good for their child. They, they don't want their child to be on electronics. Well, I, said, I think that, you see, I don't, it depends what you're doing on the electronics. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're actually actively making videos and you see, and I want to start teaching the work skill of making videos on assignment. And, and I, that's not just playing games. Right, right. And, and, and the other thing is if you're making a video, you have to go out and film stuff. You've got to go out and do that. Absolutely. You know, even if you're just doing it with a phone, you still have got to go out and 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 do stuff. I, I'm not against all electronics, but what I'm against is holding up 
in the room playing video games for eight hours a day. Okay, I had my squeeze machine, but I used that maybe an hour a day. You know, but we've got kids now when they're 21 or 22, hold up in the basement or the bedroom playing video games all day and they don't do anything else. And, and we find with Dante on the squeeze machine, he uses it when he's not escalated to the point where he can't even think about using it. Well, that's right. You want to stop the escalation. See, that's exactly. the whole idea. So, uh, uh, definitely a, an amazing tool in our family because the sensory thing is such a true thing and it's always trying to describe to other families. And that's why we do the videos to be able to let families know that there is options out there for sensory. So I thank you for being a pioneer for all these years. They, um, uh, you know, and a lot of work is done on computers. But what I'm seeing, you see, it's, the thing is unfortunate about the video games. If these kids were getting fabulous jobs programming video games or doing animation or even in sales or something for a, for a video game company, I'd have a much nicer attitude about it. Mm -hmm. But they're not going into the field in good jobs. In fact, Silicon Valley parents, out in Silicon Valley, Parents, the companies like Microsoft and Google, and they can, they don't let their kids play video games all day. They know how addictive they are. They'll let their kids go on a computer to learn programming. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But what I've, they've, you know, they've designed these games to be very addictive, and I'm not seeing good outcomes from this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now that the kids out making videos, I, I want to start. Let's start making videos on assignment. And then I'd like to, well, like make up some commercials and things like that. You know, then people, you know, hire you to film weddings and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's stuff they can turn into a job, photography. Absolutely. Also, I taught, I've talked to a lot of news crews that come and interview me, camera people. I've talked to a lot of these camera people. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them that are dyslexic or autistic camera people. They just started out, you know, being what's called a grip on a set. Grips like grip a lot of stuff, hold stuff. And then eventually they, they learn the whole, whole bunch of stuff. And that's a good field. Very it's also a field where you can show off some of your camera work in a portfolio. You see, the other thing we got to do is be finding back doors into jobs. They're everywhere and people just don't see them. That's why the portfolio needs to be on the parent's phone, the kid's phone, because you never know who you might be able to show it to. Totally agree. And yeah. then the, you're going to make a video of somebody's wedding. And then you've got to make kind of video that the bride and groom are going to want. See, this is learning how to do a task on assignment. I don't think they're going to want pictures of, I don't know, the grass. Exactly. Oh, Emily. Thank, you, thank you for continuing being a pioneer, uh, Temple, and uh, you're very revered in our family and uh, all the best to you. Thank you so much for your time. Well, uh, thank you. And I just want to see, but I see a lot of problems where I'm seeing parents that are too afraid to let go when I suggest something like the next time you're at a gas station and you're filling your car, send the kid in to buy a jug of milk. And you're right there. You can see into the shop. And I've had parents afraid to do that things that basic. Mm -hmm. Emily, over to you. Cool, thank you. Um, hi, Temple. I am a special education teacher in San Francisco, and I really have resonated with the way you've described the different types of minds with students with autism. I see so much potential in the students that I work with, and my question for you is how can I and other teachers be better advocates for our students with others who may hold limiting beliefs about Well, you see, that's them. very, very general, very ver probably verbal. You see, verbal thinkers overgeneralize. And I think this is one of the things that's caused a lot of label locking is overgeneralizing. And, and if you're in a school that has art and sewing and woodworking, I loved sewing, woodworking, and art when I was in elementary school. If I had those classes, I would have hated elementary school. And if you have those classes, music, theater, I wasn't interested in being in the play, but I made costumes and sets when I was in elementary school, high school, and college. That was my contribution to theater. 
but that's something where you can get some friends who shared interests too. But even in college, I got bullied. And then we had a school-wide talent show and I sung a goofy song and I made sets for it. And that's something that helped me get friends. You know, that's a really important thing, friends who shared interests. Definitely. Ross, over to you. Hi. Can I? Oh, well, somebody wrote here. Here, I wrote, I wrote, we're so excited to meet you. We think you're extraordinary, but we have a question. So our son is 10. Um, we're really interested in having him develop better fine motor skills so that he can engage in the trades when he goes into high school and he can start learning those things. But he has some significant issues with sensory in his hands and he doesn't like any sort of pressure on his hands. So he struggles with fine motor skills. And we're wondering how you could suggest we combat that so that he can start to be able to engage in some trades. Have you talked to an OT or PT about that? Yes, so we do behavioral therapy and he does go to OT. He has services in school once a week and then we take him once a week. Well, and there's some skilled trades where um, those motor skills, um, uh, they they affected some of my stuff in skilled trades. I don't, I tried welding, I couldn't, but you know what? I drew drawings for welders. Yeah, so, so drafting, he like drafting, the motor skills don't, uh, don't cause a problem because I always had a ruler. He doesn't and like- that like, solved the problem with the motor skills. He like, for example, won't open a jar because he doesn't like to press on something, um, but he'll stim with objects, but he won't, he has a hard time holding on to yeah, things. Felt, yeah, and I had, I had some clumsiness. Somebody, I was at a meeting up in, up in um, Bismarck, North Dakota OT meeting and somebody asked, well, you haven't talked much about sports. Well, I was kind of klutzy in sports. And no matter how hard I tried, I could never learn ski correctly where you keep them together like this. No matter how hard I tried, a ton of lessons, couldn't do it. And, and, and now there's some exceptions. There are some, there's an autistic basketball player that's got a book and he um, helps the getting people with autism into sports. But I'm one of the ones where clumsy and klutzy is kind of how I am. So sports is not, <clears throat> I could never get really good. I'm, but, you know, and I have um, some klutzy things. Is he improving on any of this motor skill stuff? Yeah, it's getting better, but still has a really hard time picking things up, touching things. I'd like to get his hands wet if he has to clean a dish or, so this is like a sensory thing that we're noticing. What if he wears gloves? There's all kinds of work gloves, amazing different kinds of work gloves. Good idea. And um, I think some of this, you know, you get the right gloves. I mean, go in the a store that sells work supplies, you'll be amazed at the different kinds of gloves and things that they've got there. Awesome. Clarissa, ready for your question? Thank you. Yes, I'm a young adult on the spectrum and my special interest is psychology and so I psychology been, you were saying psychology yes and okay. I have a bachelor's degree in it and I've been considering in the long term going back and working towards becoming a therapist and okay. I've kind of been for a while I've been questioning whether I can even be a good therapist because I'm on the spectrum um but I've kind of been considering exploring that by um by talking to some other therapists on, who are on the spectrum and kind of picking their brain a bit. Well, I but think what other... to do with, I'm a big fan of trying on careers, but the, due to confidentiality, they're probably not going to let you go to a therapy session because those are too private. No, 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 I don't. I don't mean that. I just mean like. Um, well, the thing but, that there's some but, advantages to that, but. Um, I just mean asking questions like, okay, like, um, how were you, how did you handle grad school? Like, how do you, what were the struggles with becoming, um, I can tell you one of my big struggles is um, math. I can't but, um, math. And I'm very concerned right now that some of the, um, uh, uh the you know, talented people we need you know, for a lot of things, building stuff and things like that, you can't get through, can't do algebra. But in industry, that's a huge back door. 
And, mm -hmm. and I've often thought, well, what would I do? And someone waved a magic wand and I'm 18, uh, can't do algebra, flunking out of school, but I have the knowledge I have now. Yeah. And well, I the knowledge I have you. now, um, I'd get a laborer job in a big corporation. Yeah. And I think it's that's very, good very point. easy to work up. You have to pay your dues. You have to pay yeah. your dues. But that's a good a large point. corporation that's expanding. You can work up really quickly without the degree. Now, you can't do that yeah. in things that require a degree like psychology. But right. the thing I found in engineering, I've done tons of engineering, but I had to be very, very careful never to use that title. I always wrote livestock handling consultant. And then the drafting person that took a one semester community college class always signed his letters draftsman. Mm -hmm. I had to be very, very careful. Can't use My the title question. of a licensed profession. But let me tell you, I've done a ton of, ton of engineering, steel and concrete work, tons of it, drawing the drawings for it. Mm -hmm. And I've had to correct drawings that uh, engineering firm did for concrete work and they left, didn't draw in the reinforcement rods correctly. I, had to, I did that when I was penciling that drawing in, I said, take that back to the fancy engineering company and they need to draw the rebar in there correctly because it's ridiculous, this drawing. Um, and, and you go look at big engineering projects, you've got the, what I call the clever engineering department. And these are the ones who are the grad, barely graduated from high school, but they're patenting stuff. And these are the ones that we're losing, we need them. We need them. All the people I'm working with are 50s, 60s, and 70s. And then we're retiring. I don't know who's going to keep the power plants going. Well, well, my question is that because so many autistic job programs are focused on things like technology and all of those things, um, how should a young adult on the spectrum go about exploring a career that does not fit one of the- Well, there's a lot of careers that actually some people on the spectrum are very good at sales. Mm -hmm. I gave a talk this summer to a big bank, great big bank company, and they have two autistic salesmen for high-end financial products. This has nothing to do with technology, mm -hmm. but the verbal bankers know all the ins and outs of height of fancy financial products I don't even understand. And they told me they were very good at the sales, uh, sales jobs, because sales social is a very structured kind of social. You, you can easily learn that. And selling very specialized things. That's not technology. Um, and that's something that person on the spectrum can often be very good at, selling something specialized. Or just working in a store. I know a guy who's got a PhD. I've known him for years. He's my age. He works at a large retail store. He's been there for 30 years. Maybe underemployed, but kept the job, has health insurance, selling a retail product. I don't think I'll say what it is. I can't be identifying him. And where he's valued for his knowledge of the products. And one of the things I talk about right now is, um, is getting um, uh, autistics. You've got to get exposed to enough things to find out what you might want to do. I talked to big corporations about why they need the different kinds of minds. Visual thinkers like for art, design, mechanics, mathematicians for computers, and chemistry, and physics. And then you need the word thinkers. They help organize everything and the different kinds of minds can be complementary skills. I've, I've talked to tech companies, I've talked to banking companies, um, retail product companies, service companies. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much here at Temple. We're gonna do one more and then I have a little closing. I know we're over time. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And also a little bit late so I can stay on you know, a little while longer. How many people have we got on here tonight? We had a lot of folks. We have over a hundred on here tonight and we're trying to get everyone's questions. And thank you so much everyone for being so engaged. It's been a really fun discussion. Uh, okay, here's something, mentra.me. I've got to look at that. I've got to look that up. Yeah, they're a super cool team. Um, awesome. All right, uh, Cindy, are you ready here? I am. Um, hi, Dr. Randon. First of hi, all, I, it is an 
it is an honor, honestly. I am so excited to actually have, um, to be able to talk to you. Um, I have a question. Um, my daughter uh, just hit puberty and uh, her pica has just increased significantly. And I wondered if you had any suggestions on how to deal with that. Um, what is she eating? Paper, um, plastic, uh, basically just anything that she's she not actually to. eating this stuff. We, uh, well, we try not to, uh, the school is managing it. Uh, and we, you know, we keep a very close eye on it, but it's, it seems to have gotten worse since she got her period. And, you know, well, we have formal. talked to the doctor. And, and, it, and is she verbal or nonverbal or? She, she is verbal. Um, but it's, you know, it's gotten to the point where she even asked for it, like, she, especially with the, the like, like toilet paper, like she asked for it, we tell her, you know, and, you know, she's very aware that she's not supposed to. Well, eat there it. might be something else that she can chew on, you know, about gum or something like that. Just, yeah, the school has, has um, worked with giving her, um, giving her ice, we give her gum. Yeah, uh, some other eat, thing that isn't going to yeah, be harmful. Yeah, um, and we're working with the doctors. The doctors have even tried to see if there's an iron deficiency, um, but it, it's gotten to the point where, she, you know, she's even aware of it, but... The um, other thing on a lot of these things, is she getting enough exercise? Because exercise helps with anxiety. I do 100 yeah. steps every night and they help me to sleep. I despise every one of them. I hate exercising. But I find that, that burst of heart exercise really does make a difference. The thing right now is because uh, with ever since the pandemic, it's been a little hard to have her be like involved in activities. And unfortunately, I have had some health issues myself. So because I'm a single mother, um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to be as active with her as I'd like. Yeah, um, I think that's but... one of the things. I mean, I, I, the problem now, well, they got another variance just coming out right now. Exactly. And, uh, I've got, I've, what I'm finding happening with the people that are just out all the time, and I have some immune issues. One of my very good friends just had a COVID breakthrough infection, didn't even know she had it. She has immune function issues. She's triple vaccinated, got 101 fever, felt really horrible the one day, and it was over with. And I said, you just had a breakthrough infection. I'm positive what that was. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, the, uh, we're not going to get away from COVID. It's not going to go away. Yeah. So, so, and the other thing too, with that is, um, as you know, with, uh, with girls in puberty, right? So well, that's the hormones this... because when the hormones hit, that's when my anxiety skyrocketed my anxiety. Yeah. Way worse that that was going to be my, my second question is going to be with this at this age, right? Where she's at 11, right? I've read books where it says that oh, yeah, at this, at this age, early. I was 14 when uh, puberty came. Yeah, she she unfortunately she had puberty very young. She got her period at, at ten and a half. Um, oh, any suggestions? Yeah, any suggestions on managing her anxiety? Um, well, you, you know, see, then you get into whether or not to do medication. Now, I think way too much medication is given out to kids like candy. It's just disgusting. I have talked to yeah. parents where the kids on eight different drugs. Some eight year olds are zombie on eight different drugs. And I find out no thought went into it. They were just throwing prescriptions at it without thought. That's horrible. Yeah, she's on I, a very low dosage of guanfacine, um, but that's about it. And I was very reluctant, helping? but the guanfacine does seem to help. And um, but that's about it. She's not on anything else. Well, the um, other thing is exercise is is going to be helpful because I found okay. hard exercise helped with the, with the panic and and that's something where. Um, you know, it's going to be so really keeping active. her active, active, okay. active, active, and 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 can she, does she do things where she interacts with other children? See, the thing is, she seems to be more interested. So this is my my daughter is the one that's into the video productive video production. Oh, she's the video she's, production. Okay. Yes, yes. So she's way more into um into that than kind of being with other kids. Um, well, then let's do a video production where we do an assignment. Do you belong to church or something where you could do a video assignment for somebody else? I'm going to look into that. Um, well, I think we just got to figure, I talked to a parent one time and her boy was really good at doing stop motion animation. 
and I suggested that he film the church picnic. And I said, why don't you get some GI Joes out in the grass and dress them up in civilian clothes and uh, you have a tug of war when you're gonna do a stop motion um, tug of war with GI Joes dressed in civilian clothes uh, in tall grass. That'd be a very, very cool stop motion. Also would get him outside. The other thing I recommend is that he do it in a church office. Gotta get mm. him out of the house. Okay, bring his computer okay. over there. He doesn't have to use their, their equipment, but get him out of the house. Okay. Uh, and, and it's also something that, that he has to make a video that of the church picnic that the congregation is going to want to see. So you could intersperse it with maybe some stop motion animation of a tug of war, you know, GI Joes with the real tug of war, you know, and edit okay. it really nicely. And then people see those skills. You know, then the local car dealership goes, hmm, maybe you make it. Yeah, no. Us. Yeah, no, she's her her skills are there. She she does she's even able to change her voice. Um, she does different voices. She she has she can have four iPads at different times and she has them um stopped at different times. She does different, she includes different um music. It's really, really amazing. Well, she, you she need knows. she needs to be you need to get her some jobs. You yeah. Get her what, or it's called, you know, gigs, you know, get some yeah. assignments. <laughs> Where she's going to go out and make a video for somebody else, uh, and that and that video has to please that somebody else, like I did with the hair salon sign. That was one of my that was my first little entrepreneur thing. Okay, you see, and that, that just simple stuff like that. Absolutely, I want to say, you know, I. I, I think I can speak for everyone. Thank you uh, for all the work that you do for the community. You are well, I want to see these kids get out and be successful. I'm seeing too many kids growing up. They've never used tools. Um, I'm, I, the, I think taking the hands-on classes out of the school is one of the worst things the schools ever did. Absolutely. You know, people ask me, if I could do something to change the schools, I can tell you, I've been putting all that stuff back in. And let, let somebody substitute algebra for business math. Like Amen to that. Mm -hmm. Well, Temple, thank you so much for your time. And thank you all for such great questions. And Temple, I just want to close out here and just, is there anything you would say as a last parting thought to everyone? Well, I want to just do everything that um, you say, okay, here's someone, oh, see, this is the problem. We've got an autism. You see, we've got such a wide spectrum. Here's a 23 year old adult, adult hits his head. What can I do for him? And he's nonverbal. Now, this is something where I have to get a lot more information before I can even start to answer that one. You know, I'm going to start out with a, does it happen when he's in a sensory noisy place? I got to rule out the painful medical problem. Is he frustrated because he can't communicate? I got to learn a lot more about him to find out when this is happening. You see, and I, I find the same problem with, okay, a dog behavior problem. Uh, you know, people say, well, my dog's crazy. Well, what did you do? Jump on somebody happy or bite up? You see, I have to get a lot more information. Well, no, here's someone wrote about the movie. You know, my mother was uh, one of the most important people and she knew just how hard to stretch and push me. And she'd always give me choices, limited choices you know, of, of activities and things I could do. Awesome. Uh, and, and the thing, it, it, the big, one of the big problems I'm seeing is, is, is they underestimate sometimes what their kids can do. And there's some things they can't do. Multitasking I can't do. Remembering long strings of verbal instruction I can't do. I've got to write it down. I don't typically like using the GPS because I have to react too quickly. So I had to go to this autism school and I didn't know they, I got the address. So I looked up Google maps and I made my own, they don't print very well. So I made my own little map. So I figured out how I'm gonna get there before I go. Cause sometimes the, the, um, the GPS, it tells you so quick. I've already, that it kind of gets me rattled. I, I just prefer, they want to have to go somewhere I don't know the way. Now, obviously, the airport, I don't do that. I know the way to the airport. <laughs> but I didn't know the way to this school. So I very carefully got on Google Maps. It took me about 15 minutes to do it. 
and drew a map and I wrote like which roads I'd have to go across and then, then I did it. And then I make myself bullet points for each turn. I-25 South, west on Colfax, go by this highway, this highway, this highway, right on north on Kipling, right on 20th Street East, just a few blocks, bullet points. And then I have the map, make, draw this little map. I did that just the other day to get to this autism school. No, I don't really like the, the GPS. It like chucks it at me too fast. Definitely. Desiree, did you want to add on to that about the movie? Um, hi, Miss Grandin. I was actually the one that was that had the question about the movie. Um, I was asking about your your point of view about your mom, because I know that I something that I've I've wondered and I know that speaking with other parents that we wonder is are our kids going to resent us for pushing so hard? Do you? I think they're going to thank you. They're going to thank you in the future. They'll be mad at the time, but thank you. Now, there's a scene in the movie where the boss throws the deodorant down and says, "You stink. Use it." The secretary's doing the shopping. <laughs> Most of those scenes happen. That happened. I thank that boss. Now, I think in the future they will thank you when they get out into some job they really like, doing things they really like. They're going to thank you for doing. it. I truly, I, I always, I have two children on the spectrum and they're fairly young, but how, how old on are the days whenever five and four. Okay. They're little, they're little kids. Okay. Cause I yeah. think and I have to ask that. Cause I kind of go, I got to talk about little kids stuff. That's like under five elementary school, high school and adult. There's like four. Yeah. Categories. We're in the process of getting the IEP for my older son who's going into kindergarten and We've been fighting with the school district and all that kind of stuff. And, and on the days whenever it gets really hard, I always go back to the movie in, in the very end when your character stands up and says that without her, without your mom, you wouldn't be where you are. Well, and, and she just, would, uh, probably wouldn't have been. You see, that's the thing. Yeah. And she had a very good sense of just how much to push me, like making sure that when I was in college that every summer I did a different internship. I was an aide for an autistic kid one summer. I worked in a research lab another summer. Mother helped facilitate those things. It was all backdoor. But you you really you really feel like it was she it was, was a driving essential. force in your life. It was essential. Yeah. I'm I'm a, I, I see moms. I remember one mom she started crying when I suggested that her 16 year old go buy something in a store. I'd never bought anything in a store. Fully verbal itself. <laughs> Oh, We're struggling right. with the verbalizing and things like that. My son has a tablet. He can, he can completely read and write anything that he wants. He is, he is amazing. He well, and that so okay. Then you use the tablet. Yeah, um, that's I what had, we do. I had use the tablet for that. everything. I, I did a, a talk uh, one of big corporation, and um, went to dinner with a deaf guy. I don't know sign language, so we passed the phone back and forth and used. The, we didn't send the text messages. We just passed the phone back and forth, texting and then erasing it, and then texting it and erasing it. And that's how we talked. Wow. Ms. With Grant, I phone. really- I mean, that's just a regular so phone. And thank you for being so open about program. your life. You know, that is something simple to do. I'm trying to also fig figure out things that you can do that don't cost a fortune. Things you can just do in- We got really lucky. The school, um, our speech therapist actually facilitated this. We didn't have to spend any money on it. She helped us get the, the tablet through the school and put the well, program protocol to go on. Well, that's great. I find when yeah. it comes to schools, people are always in the public versus private thing. I don't really want to hear that because what I yeah. find is I travel around. So much is depend upon a particular district, the particular people at the school. It's what yeah. in engineering that's called site specific in engineering. I really like this term. So one right. school is absolutely great, and another school across town is terrible. That's and, what we're finding. They both, with this they whole both might be process, highly ranked yep. schools. And one works. I remember a good friend of mine, she had a smart little boy and was at a very top private school. And the teacher hated him and he hated the teacher. And I said, you know what? You need to switch horses. And that yes. was a decent school, but it wasn't the right school for that boy. And they switched schools and then everything was fine. Yes. Thank you so much, Ms. Grandin. I truly appreciate your time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Well, I hear somebody about 23 year old, is he gonna need medication? Well, that's something it, you need to get really good advice on that. Um, 
I take, um, so you get in something where some people say, well, all medication's evil or they drown them in medication. That's total dreadful. But I take one little med and I don't think I could have achieved things I achieved without that medication. I just hope the factory that nobody hurts that factory. That's all I can say. Because that medication has really helped me. And, and some of these more severe ones probably need a little bit of the right thing. And you try carefully one thing at a time and see what it does. Because if you change programs and you do a med at the same time, you don't know what worked. Was it the change in the program or was it the med? You don't know. And you wanna start with the meds with the less severe side effects rather than starting with the heavy duty antipsychotics or atypicals that have got much more severe side effects. You know, try some of the other things, antidepressants, uh, beta blockers, uh, seizure drugs. There's a number of different things that can be tried. Um, and, and you get a med that works as kind of well. Another thing is no medication will give you 100% control of the behavior. I would say that my anxiety was about 90% controlled, not 100%. And you don't want to get into the thing where every time there's a problem, you up the dose. You don't want to get into that mess. I'd recommend reading Thinking in Pictures. We all heard a parent explain it's like a computer operating system running Windows. Um, yeah, it is kind of like that, a different operating system. You see, the things I get emotional about, like that scientist uh, involved his life's work on a single portable hard drive, I get emotional about that because his life's work was in that little box. And, and that was the most important thing to him. You know, I can, I can relate to that. And, and I, 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 I talked to one lady, she got a job at a big computer company and she was really happy with that. She says, I'm with my people now. I've been out to the tech companies. Half those programmers were on the spectrum. Been there. Mm -hmm. Been that. I've walked into a room one time, a big tech company, 100 programmers sitting at long bench desks, big picture window on one side. So that's going to be really good from a lighting standpoint. So you don't have problems with things like LED lights flickering, mm -hmm. silence. 100 of them silently, headphones on, each computer doing something different. One question that's coming and up. They, in, but they, were, they were happy there. Temple, one question that's come up in the chat and through some DMs is just around when parents should have the conversation with their kids on the spectrum. Well, I think it depends upon how well the, you know, how well the kid is doing. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, if a kid's doing just fine, he doesn't need to know. You know it's, but where, where a diagnosis really helps later in life, this is a book, Different Not Less, and this is 18 adults, older adults, getting diagnosed later in life and their marriages had problems. And this is where a diagnosis really was helpful. And this is where a diagnosis of relief. I've had wives say to me, oh, your book enabled me to understand my engineer husband and we and it saved our marriage. See, that's where it's helpful in the relationships because the things that, I get emotional about aren't the same things that most people get emotional about. Like getting really emotional about the scientist trying to save his life's work. That's something that I get very emotional about. Joanne, do you want to ask your question? Okay, here you say ABA is working. Well, if ABA is working for you, then do it. Because so much depends upon not the name of the program, the teachers, the people that do it. And ABA, it, there's all kinds of ABA, from really good, flexible ABA that recognizes the sensory problems and works with OTs to rigid, old-fashioned ABA that's just terrible. And some of the advocates that despise ABA were exposed to some very bad, old-fashioned ABA. They were forced into sensory overload, and that's why they hated it. Also, uh, forced to do too much stupid, busy work. Mm -hmm. like temple? Hi, Temple. temple. Um, I'm the parent of an adult child. Uh, well, she's an adult and uh, she's done so amazingly well. She surpassed everything, every step of the way. She's graduated from uh, university with history and music. 
Yeah, the thing is that now she's working at a grocery store, um, having such a hard time, you know, fitting into the world of work and finding something. Well, you see, meaningful. this is the thing. It, see, the, the mistake that gets made mm -hmm. is that in college, she should have been transitioning into the world of work in music. You see, and when I was in high school, I had a sign painting business. I ran a horse farm. Didn't do any study, but I ran a horse farm. Mm -hmm. I did mm -hmm. everything except the financials. Cleaned eight, nine stalls every day. I fed them, put them in and out, repaired damage in the barn, and mm -hmm. and learned working skills. Mm -hmm. I was out of my aunt's branch, and I did learn. And and I there was work stuff I had to do there. Temple all along, yes, yeah, she did. She did play in the orchestra. She's right now. She's in a band. She's in two bands. Good. But again, music is not something that she's going to earn a living. She needs a day job. And well, this then, is then in a, you know, there's a, you know, then the thing is, if you do good in the grocery store, then they put you in management, and then that can make problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Rachel, she she speaks very quickly, and sometimes it's hard to understand. So you know, so direct contact with customers, things like this is often difficult. And I'm sorry to say this, I love her, but she can be rude. <laughs> you know, well, like direct this is where there has point. to be, you have to explain to her what exactly she did that was rude. You can't just be vague and say, you're rude to customers. That's too vague. Okay, now let's say, well, you told them, you told the lady she was too fat. Okay, that's like absolutely unacceptable. But you have to explain to her what she did that was rude. When I was in graduate school in the 80s, there were some people that thought that I was uh, stuck up because I didn't say hi when I went past other people in the corridor. Well, now I've learned to do that. Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. that has to be taught. Mm -hmm. So I have to find out what is she specifically doing in that grocery store that's considered rude. And then we coach her. It's just like, I have to know not to show the bottom of my foot if I go to a Middle Eastern country because that's, that's rude. I didn't, mm -hmm. I wouldn't know that. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, uh, like um, a job such as data entry, things like this would be good for her. But again, it's, it's been very difficult. Mm -hmm. And sometimes she will find jobs. She'll, she'll lose the job. So and why is it, she losing the jobs? Oh my goodness. The, the last job that she had, uh, unfortunately she got very frustrated. Um, it was based on uh, sales and things like this performance. And she got upset and she kicked a door and, uh, uh, yeah. see, now, the thing I had to do with anger, because I got in trouble for that. I got kicked out of school for anger. You have to mm -hmm. switch to crying. You have to switch to crying. And um, well, just the other day, I was at this autism school, and I saw a door labeled electrical room. Well, when I was in the big meat plants, that was one of my favorite places to go to cry, because nobody would go in there, and I knew what not to touch. I never did in the restrooms. But I didn't want anybody to see me, so I'd go in the electrical room or I'd go under the stairs. I had places in big packing plants where I would hide when I got really upset. Someone had been mean to me. No one, it was very difficult, but you don't get fired for crying. And I made mm -hmm. sure that they didn't see me. That's why I went in the electrical room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see the door right now against the brick wall. Uh, and it was right next to the restroom. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, they, they um, I see anger is one thing. It's just not tolerated at work. I can tell you when NASA canceled the space shuttle, NASA space scientists cried on national television. It was the saddest mm -hmm. thing you ever saw. Mm -hmm. Because NASA space scientists that, that throw wrenches get fired. NASA does not tolerate any angry word. Mm -hmm. Temple, one other, one other question I really have to ask you, and that is um, with, my, with Rachel, I told her that she had Asperger's when she was in junior high. This is because the school wanted me to tell her. And, All right. and do you know that she never accepted it? She's 30 now. And if um, it's just something she's never accepted about herself. Well, okay. Oh. Elon Musk has autism. He's on the autism spectrum. Maybe mm -hmm. she needs to watch the Saturday Night Live segment. It can be found on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I think he came out and said he had Asperger's, which is the no speech delay type of autism. Uh, Michelangelo probably was autistic. Edison, Tesla, Einstein. Mm -hmm. you know, in other words, an autistic brain is often more interested in what they do, like music, mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. sort of a relationship stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, you see that scientist, if he loses that hard drive, uh, he's going to grieve for his work, you know, be the same way as if his 
closest friend died mm -hmm. because he's into his work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think and, this is just a this is just a process, and I think you know one day I hope that she will be autonomous and living on her own. But um, anyway, she's done remarkably well. But and did she live on? Did she live at home or or the dorm? Still lives at, no, she lives at home. And she, lives she, she would lived at home when she went to the university. She always lives lived at home, okay. and I, it would be very difficult for her to be on her own because she needs she needs that guidance and and to really um, because she she can go off center very very quickly. Yeah, but they uh, so but at least that she's ongoing she's keeping the job at the grocery store because maybe a sales job is just too much pressure. Yeah, yeah, she's keeping the job at the, oh, the keeping the grocery store. store. At least she's keeping it. And yeah, and that, she's playing her music. Yeah, and she's mm -hmm. playing her music and and. Um, you know, and then maybe, you know, I don't think she wants to manage the grocery store, but uh, no. <laughs> but there's there's more difficult work. She might be very good at some of the buying and ordering and, you know, they've got to get the stuff in and mm -hmm. order their supplies. And and mm -hmm. there's a lot, quite a lot of back office work at a grocery store, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, that they get the goods in. They got to get put on the shelf. Somebody has to be in charge of that. Mm -hmm. But I like to be sure about they them. don't run out of toilet paper. <laughs> you see, yeah. but that, but that is, um, there's somebody in the store that does that. You see, and that's a, a, and it's a job. It's kind of a more technical kind of a job. And if I had to work in a grocery store, that would be the kind of stuff I would like to do. I'm gonna be really good at keeping that store stocked and mm -hmm. not having a bunch of stuff laying around I can't sell. Um, that goes bad on me. I'd be good at things like, okay, I've got stuff, old bread and things like that. I don't want to throw it in the dumpster and make sure it goes to the soup kitchen where it's not going to be throwing perfectly good food away. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are things I'm thinking about right now. If I start running the back end of a, you know, of a big Kroger or some other Safeway or some other big grocery store. Mm -hmm. Well, they got creative during the, during the lockdown. Oh, they had semi trailers out in the parking lot that they, well, they were storing stuff. Mm -hmm. Temple, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, and especially okay. what you said about going in the back door. That we have to well, think creatively. All these back doors, and people don't see them. It's a very important scene in the movie where I go up and I get the editor's card because I knew if I wrote for that magazine, that would really help my career. Really help my career. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. saw that back door. And then I produced a good article that summarized my master's thesis on cattle handling. Mm -hmm. People don't see the back doors. They're right there. They don't see them. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's so that's what we're going to look for. Jobs are back door. Mm -hmm. Temple, thank you so much. And Joanne, great questions. Everyone, great questions tonight. Thank you so much for well, anyone. Okay, well, it's time to sign off. And I've got okay. things i got to get done tonight. And Definitely. Um, I just got sent a journal article I need to read. So it's great to talk to everybody. Definitely. And for anyone who has more questions, we have an active community, uh, beaminghealth.com, Amy threw it in the chat, where lots of families and experts jump in on these kinds of questions. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Okay, well, great to talk to you. Thanks, Temple. Okay. Appreciate all right. Okay. You're amazing. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.